Somewhere in the Skies is brought to you by HelloFresh. Delicious, healthy food delivered to your door and made in your kitchen. Next time you're listening to the show while preparing your HelloFresh meal, visit HelloFresh.ca and use the promo code SOMEWHERE50 for 50% off your first box. Courtesy of your friends at the Antica Podcast Network and HelloFresh. This is Somewhere in the Skies with Ryan Sprague. What is up, my ghouls, ghosts, goblins, and greys? Ryan Sprague here, and this is our second installment of spooky listener tales as we count down the days until Halloween. This week, Steve recalls an eerie encounter with a shadow figure in his West Hollywood home in Los Angeles. Have a listen. About 20 years ago, I was living in a beautiful building in West Hollywood that had been constructed in 1926 in the Renaissance Revival style. So it was typically Los Angeles, typically Hollywood, and very beautiful and very old. I lived there with a roommate, and uh, one night I was sleeping in my bed with my cats, and I think my cats started stirring or else I felt like I was being stared at. So I opened my eyes and standing at the foot of my bed and staring back at me was a shadow figure of a man. Uh, He was three-dimensional, solid black. He looked like black velvet. And my room wasn't very dark because there was a streetlight always shining in through my window, which I appreciated. Uh, So he was so dark and he stood out so much and he was three-dimensional and I although I couldn't see any features as far as facial features I could see all of the very clear cut outline of his figure he was about 5'10 had sort of longish hair I think he was wearing a jacket and my cats and I lay there in the bed staring at him for what seemed like an eternity but was probably only a minute or a minute and a half and then As I watched, he floated toward the ceiling and disappeared. After that, I did the thing that a lot of people report doing that seems so incredulous in that I turned back over and went to sleep. And I think one of the reasons I did this is because he seemed curious, not so menacing. And the clencher to this story is about a year later, my roommate and I were moving out And I told him that I had seen a figure in my room one time, about a year before. And my roommate got visible chill bumps and a shiver running down his spine and proceeded to tell me a story about trying to get to sleep one night when he felt someone staring at him. And he turned over in his bed and standing in the open doorway of his closet was the shadow figure of a man. I let him describe it first And it sounded exactly like what I saw. And so to me, that validates our stories because neither of us suggested it to each other. We both had separate experiences with this same man. And when we did a little research and talked to some neighbors who had lived there for a long time, we found out that a writer for television who had lived in that apartment about a decade and a half before we did had died there. Ooh, wow. Okay. Was this the shadowy spirit of a tormented television writer? I'd love to hear your thoughts. And if you have a ghost or monster encounter story you'd like to share on the show, I'd love to hear that as well. Reach me through the contact tab on the website, somewhereintheskies.com. We are oozing towards that special October night, and it only gets creepier from here on out. Thank you so much to Steve for sharing his story. And hey... Having recently moved only a handful of blocks away from West Hollywood, where this happened, maybe I can actually go investigate the apartment in question. Or maybe I could hire this week's guest to do the shadowy work for me. So, without further ado, let's get to this week's episode with investigator, researcher, and host of Into the Fray Radio, Shannon LeGros. 
Today, we are talking to one of my heroes. She is the one who inspired me to become a podcaster myself, so you would not be listening to this right now if it were not for her. So, Shannon Legro, thank you so much for joining me today on Somewhere in the Skies. Well, hello, Ryan. It's uh, it's so good to be chatting with you again. Thanks for having me. It's been a long time coming, and I thought this would be the perfect time to have you on. We are counting down the days until Halloween. How are you feeling? Are you, are you looking forward to this year? Any big plans? Yeah, the house is definitely decorated, but I think it needs more decorations. In fact, <laughs> I saw at Home Depot, and actually this is last year, but I'm sure they still have it because it's epic. They have a full-size skeleton of a horse, uh, which looks insanely creepy. I mean, it's it's pretty darn large. It's not Whoa. what they call the old 10 hand high or whatever that is. It's not a full, full size, but it's a good little size horse. And I'm like, you know what, if I got that thing, I think it was like 300 bucks. I'm like, worth every penny. I would leave it up all year long. Where would you put it? Would you put it outside or inside? Oh, right in the living room. Just <laughs> greeting folks as they walk in the door. Yeah. Oh, my God. That's terrifying. <laughs> yeah. Got to get like the, the headless horseman or something. Just, just you know, if for Christmas, he can wear a, a Santa hat and yeah. you know, just festive him up. Yes, absolutely. I, this is like, I, I don't know about you, but many of us who are into these sorts of topics, paranormal, supernatural, UFOs, I mean, this is our Christmas. It really is. Like, it's our time to celebrate the weirdness we have within us and the stuff that we look into. Um, so yeah, this is the time where I decorate. I, I rarely decorate for Christmas, but Halloween, it's just pumpkins everywhere and, you know, bats coming from the ceiling. I absolutely love it. Yeah, um, this is the time of year where we're like, oh, here's my freak flag and I'm real, I mean, I usually fly pretty high anyway, but this time of year, favorite. It's awesome. Pumpkin pride for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Pumpkin fried, new hashtag, love it. <laughs> love it, we're going to start And we're not that. all talking about pumpkin spice lattes, which some people, it's so funny because they'll start posting, like middle of last month, they're like, brace yourselves for pumpkin spice everything. <laughs> it's so true. And you know what really bothers me? Like, I do fall victim to that. I got a pumpkin spice latte probably a week before October even started, or uh, uh, before autumn even started, I should say. Uh -huh. And, you know, of course, it's delicious because it's pure sugar going into your gut. It, but uh, you know, it's it's just it's not pumpkin. That's what I I try to convince people of. Like this tastes nothing like actual pumpkin. Yeah, I bet if you took like pumpkin guts and you put it in a French press, it would probably just be a, a bloody mess. So yeah. yeah, I'm not sure what that is, but it's not pumpkin. Yeah, it's that uh, that whole Mandela effect happening. Like everyone's like, oh <laughs> yes, this is what pumpkin tastes like. It always has. Yeah, <laughs> mm, the old the old red. Red pill, blue pill? Like, yep. is this what steak tastes like? Or is this what my brain tells me that steak is supposed to taste like? Mm. Exactly. I'm going to have to do a whole episode on just that. Mandela, <laughs> Mandela steak. Yeah, dude. Absolutely. <laughs> Especially with where where the hell does pumpkin spice actually come from? Hmm. I, I do. Is not there want to is know. there like a puppy mill? Is there a pumpkin spice mill somewhere? They're just slaughtering like no. strange pumpkins for our our enjoyment. <laughs> That's where all that shrieking is coming from. <laughs> <laughs> and pumpkin slaughter now that's right you know what they had at the pumpkin patch i took my daughter and you know they have these little pumpkin masters carving kits yeah yeah I well now those. yeah now they have a battery powered saw so you can really go full like massacre on your pumpkins wow. there's a little little saw for you mm -hmm. perfect i i am not going to uh i'm not going to judge that at all if someone wants <laughs> to do that be my guest i went to a place where they do like the uh the pumpkin catapults so like you can oh put with them the in... like the trebuchet kind of thing yeah and you could like send them flying like a mile away it's pretty fun it was i pretty think fun. at um one of the one of the farms in Oregon, somebody got really hurt with a trebuchet. I mean, those things, they go awry, they go really awry. And you're going to lose a limb or, I mean, something's going real bad. The organs are going to explode. Can you imagine, like, that being, say that was, like, in the autopsy of someone who, who died by a flying pumpkin? Yeah, that would be a little, little, yeah. little bit strange. 
They're like, what? pumpkin, trebuchet, what the hell? <laughs> what are these people doing? What is like, going on? Halloween, hashtag Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, again, it is an appropriate time to have you on the show because you are the reason that I started doing all this and looking into all this. And you have your own show, Into the Fray Radio, which we are definitely going to dive into, where you cover a vast array of topics. And before we even get into the show, Shannon, I do want to ask you, because I'm sure some of our listeners may not know. How did you get involved in all this craziness that we all seem to uh, find ourselves thrust into? Where did it all begin? What is your origin story? Yes, the origin story, which a lot of us, you know, seem to have. And mine is a little unlike other people's. It It's not, the subject is very similar to others. It's a shadow person story mm-hmm. or shadow people. But the difference is mine happened in broad daylight. Um, mm. This was in Duck Creek, Utah. I was uh, 11, 12 years old. And I'm riding on my four-wheeler, which we did um, every day that we were up there for the summer, every day, all day. And if we weren't doing that, we were fishing or hiking and on this particular day now this is like midday nice sunny day out there in duck creek my two brothers were pretty far in front of me on their four wheelers but we're we're going pretty darn fast down these dirt roads and it's set up like a grid pattern near where my dad's cabin was and mind you there are plenty of other cabins in the area a lot a lot of people can be around at some points in time this is a pretty quiet day so we're cooking with Crisco's. We're going down this road and I was hanging back because it actually hadn't rained for a while. So it was a little dusty. So I'm letting them go forward and they can tear the road up and kick dust up all they want, but I'm going to hang back. And I didn't have my helmet on on this particular day, which was a little strange, but I think my dad was down in town doing something. So I was like, oh, I'm going to be a rebel and not wear my helmet. So we're riding very quickly down dirt road and I, I glanced to my right at one point into the woods and this This isn't like thick woods, like the Olympic National Forest or anything where you have like moss on the ground and massive evergreen trees covering every inch of the forest where you can't see through. There's a lot of aspens and there are pines, but it's a pretty clear shot to where you can see back a a good ways. So I would say maybe 30 yards in, there are four and tall being six to six and a half feet figures and they're, they're darker than blacker than night. They're completely devoid of of light as if they're just a black hole, like a cut out of the darkest night that you've ever been witness to just cut out and plastered into this space. And they're running and they're keeping up with me on my furler and I'm going quite fast. And the way they're moving though is kind of funny because the the second I look at them, I know they're just wrong. They're they're completely devoid of light. And I'm looking at them like they're moving their arms and legs, you know, like we would if we were booking it right down, down the road or something. But they weren't interacting with the trees at all. Like they didn't need to really be hopping over anything or ducking and diving in these aspen trees that they were running through, I guess. But I I can say, honestly, I don't remember thinking, oh my God, that one just went through a tree. Mm -hmm. It just, they were just running. I don't really know how else to describe that, but I do instantly remember thinking that they were just completely abnormal. Uh, They're not of this world. And why am I seeing this? I look at them for about a count of five, which, you know, if you count 1,001, 1,002, 1,000, it's it's a good little amount of time to see something. Mm -hmm. And of course, I'm hauling butt on the four-wheeler, so I have to look forward again and check my path. I look back quickly and they are gone just completely gone. No sign of them, no trace. Catch up to my brothers at some point. And I said, I'm going back to the cabin. And I didn't tell anybody anything at first. But then when my dad got back, I told him what I saw. And he said that, well, you know, sometimes they do military exercises in the woods. So maybe you saw some military men, you know, in their gear or whatever, doing some kind of drills. And I just remember telling my dad, mm, these just, they were not people. Mm-hmm. I don't know what to tell you, but these were not people. They were keeping pace with me. And, you know, and he, it's not like he was poking fun, but he was just pretty adamant that, well, it, it was people. They were, yeah. they, they were military men. So that's, that was, that was it. That was my inception story. Just five seconds glancing over in the woods and, and seeing those those four figures running alongside of me. Yeah. And I, a lot of people ask me, what are they? What, what do you think they are? I have no idea. I have no clue. There's been plenty of ideas thrown out there. Uh, Demons, uh, probably demons, right? Like from OK Talk, that Mm. guy that came on, (laughs) everything's a demon. Even dinosaurs are probably demons. Uh, (laughs) Multidimensional creatures. I have heard before Bigfoot. 
I'm like, nope, certainly wasn't Bigfoot. Mm-mm. I, that, that was not what I saw. I, so, yeah, that, that was it. And I mean, the fact that it can happen so quickly and can sort of just change your entire life. I mean, we hear about this all the time. I mean, it was the same with me with my UFO sighting. And that's how you and I connected, which we'll get to in a moment. And then to have a parent try to calm us down and say there was some conventional yeah. prosaic explanation. Of course, that's a parent's job is to protect their children and, you know, show them Hopefully that the world is a much safer place than we hope, right. that, that, the safer place that we want it to be. I, I can't imagine what that w- must have been like. And you did mention that it was not Bigfoot. Now, a lot of people may know you for that. And that's how I got introduced to your work is I... I was never into Bigfoot. I'm not going to lie. I've been a UFO guy my whole life. I thought big sh- I big shit, I was about to say. <laughs> um, <laughs> he is a big shit. He I mean. is a big shit. Bigfoot was <laughs> bullshit to me. I just didn't believe yeah. in it. And the more I started looking into all these other topics, I'm like, I got to give this a chance. Like, people probably look at me crazy all the time for believing in UFOs. So I came across some shows and heard from you, and you were talking about your investigations and your research into cryptids and i was like who is this person like they actually know their stuff they know what's going on and i actually believe them you are so genuine and authentic in how you were talking about the topics and it's rare to find that and that's sort of how we got hooked up we um i contacted you and i was like look i really like what you're doing out there um this is a topic i've never been interested in but i'd love to learn more and that's kind of how the inception of our i guess work relationship started would you say? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, and look at the the journey that we've both had since then, which is incredible. And I've met so many amazing people doing this. Yeah, yeah. So let's let's talk about Into the Fray. Now, where did this idea come from? I, I know it was your brainchild from the start and it was a passion project of yours. How how did it all come about? What made you finally take that leap to be like, I am going to put my voice out there to the masses, no matter what they think? <laughs> yeah. And, and that's something that if anyone's going to start a podcast, you have to keep that in mind. You're not ever going to please everybody all the time. You're going to get mail saying, oh my gosh, I can't believe that you said that. Or why didn't you say this? So you have to make yourself happy as a podcaster. I'm just going to put that out there right now. Okay. Sorry. I was digressing there. i get off my little soapbox there. Nope, <laughs> um, I loved it. <laughs> yeah. He, we, well, we would always joke about, oh, after this intro segment, we're going to get some mail. And I would always throw throw my email address out there, right? So, uh, Yeah, so, I mean, I have to give a nod here, of course, to Wes Germer of Sasquatch Chronicles because he's the one that saw that I was very active in his Facebook page. And, I mean, Bigfoot is kind of my baby, which is strange considering uh, the story that I just told you, right? But he noticed my activity in the group, and he's, you know, he just started to chat with me. And he decided to bring me on board Sasquatch Chronicles as one of the co-hosts. And then eventually he gave me my own space. And that was show notes with Shannon, which was live, by the way. Um, and there are some really epic radio moments that happen on live. Um <laughs> And I, I think that Ryan, that you've, I think you've told me you've, you've heard snoring Steve yep. and that whole thing before, but, uh, I think that the show notes are still out there and I, I do believe that it was the episode that Bono came on, or maybe it was one Jesus Jr. was on, but it was a live show and, and I have call-ins cause it was blog talk radio. And I went back to a caller that said he had a story and he was sawing logs, <laughs> snoring so loud. I'm like, oh, Jesus, <sighs> this is, there's live radio for you. So I do miss aspects of that because boy that keeps you on your toes you got to think on the fly and of course looking back I'm like I could have been so much more witty I could have been like my god am I that boring but anyway so there was show notes and then when I left Sasquatch Chronicles I thought you know as much as I love Bigfoot I, I do also have a passion for other things and of course the only one thing that I saw with my own eyes had nothing to do with Bigfoot so why don't I do a multi-topic show and and people love to put up the poem from the movie the gray which you know into the fray is is mentioned in mm-hmm. that poem um that is not where it came from i know that i just i wanted and i should actually post this someday i think it's in the notes of my iphone one of the notes in in there the many notes mm-hmm. to keep track of things is the where the name 
came from. And I think at one point there was like an into the into the gray or into the, you know, something black or dark or, you know, mm-hmm. the, and it kind of formed into into uh, into the fray. Uh, and when I went on to I remember going on to Google and iTunes and just crossing my fingers that there wasn't a podcast named exactly that. And there wasn't. So that was the inception of of the old ITF right there. Oh, that's a great story. I, I love hearing how it all started. And I had that exact moment where you're Googling, you, you come up with this <laughs> idea yeah. that you think is just perfect for what you want to do. It embodies everything you want to say in like two, three words. And then somebody else has it. I deal with this all the time when I'm titling plays and movies. I write, I the, you know, I, I spend years writing this. And then I usually, I'm a, the kind of writer who leaves the title till the last moment because even if I were to come up with a title beforehand, it would change immediately, like upon right. like the first couple pages. And that I run into that all the time. Oh, that's copywritten. Oh, you can't do that for another 20 years. This, that, this, that. Oh, that must be heartbreaking for you. It's frustrating for sure. But you know what? You just move on and that's kind of how it is. You know, you think yeah. that you're the only one in the world that has this idea, but uh, it doesn't always work out that way. But I would have to say with Into the Fray, you're really doing something very interesting in that you're bringing on people to tell their stories. Now, we all in the podcasting world love interviewing, quote unquote, experts, uh, researchers, people who are like really into this, authors. But I think it's really important what you do is you bring on the people having the experiences. And that's extremely vital. Without witnesses to these things, we would have nothing to research. We would have nothing to talk about on these shows. So that's what really drew me into becoming a part of Into the Fray. And uh, and for you allowing me to do that has been amazing to come on and hear these people's stories because it makes me start to open up and be like, oh my God, like this person is totally credible. They're just in every everyday person like I am. And they saw this. They saw a Bigfoot. They saw this out there. Uh, it, it's amazing. Now, you are past 100 episodes now with Into the Fray. So first of all, congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, it goes by like a blur. I can't even believe it. Thanks for bringing that up about people's you know, personal stories. That's what I really enjoy the most. As much, like you said, as much as I love talking to the author and the researcher, I get in that person that is like, oh, you can hear it in their voice. They're, they're shaky and they're scared, which I was too when I first started telling my story. Yeah. Uh, it took me a long time. There's nothing like that. And by the time they're done, they're not nervous anymore. And sometimes they, they just, they, they're like, thank you. Thank you for letting me just get that out and tell my story. And, you know, if, if after recording, someone's like, you know what, I don't really even think that I want that on the show. I, I would never be upset or mad. It's not always about, you know, getting those downloads and everything. It's really a, a it's a big human experience and it's happening, you know, right through your, right through my, my Sony earbuds that I, when I do the recordings and I'm like, man, this changed this person's life. And I totally get it because I had the same experience and, and so did you. So it's kind of when you hear someone so genuine, maybe even they're getting emotional on the line and you're like, no, no, you're, you're doing, you're doing great. Keep pushing through. I promise it'll feel amazing when you're done. And usually they agree that it does. It feels good to get that out there. Absolutely. I mean, we've both been on the other side of it too. I have you on today recounting your experience. Experience. When I've had to recall my UFO sighting to people, uh, it's not that easy. It's not like you're just like, this happened on this date. It was yeah. crazy. Wow. Uh, no, it it takes a lot to like, first of all, memory is faulty. So you're trying your best to recall this event that happened, God, for you and I when we were 12, thir- 11, 12, 13 years old. Yeah. You know, try try to remember something that happened to you that far back. It's not easy. Now, there's certain moments or uh, maybe emotions that you felt or a sense that came forward during it. Uh, but other than that, it's not like you're telling a perfect story for anybody. So just like you, when people come on to recall these things, you have to be patient. You have to be compassionate. That's the one thing I've learned when interviewing people. You can't go in prejudging it. You know, I, I would never be that kind of person to bring someone on and then, you know, say, no, that's that's you're lying or this or that. Like, hear them out and let them take the time to do it. That's what editing is for. <laughs> yeah. And I just want to touch on something you said that's really important about memory. And that is that it, it is faulty. And I think if someone, you know, was like, you have to come up with 5,000 words describing your experience, I would really be hesitant to do that because unless I was going to fill in blanks that I wasn't
wasn't sure even existed. That's why when I retell it, I really try to keep it very general because that is my memory of the experience. Like I don't remember the color of the leaves or, you know, or if I could, they were quite solid to me, but I mean, maybe if I had looked down nearer to their feet or something, they would have been see-through, but my mind doesn't remember that. So I'm not going to just throw that in there. So yeah, I, that, that's a really good point about memory being uh, extremely, uh, it's a fickle thing. It's really, really fickle. Yeah. And it remembers what it wants to, I think too, you know, and yeah, puts other yeah. things in that dark corner that we may never really know. I mean, with me, I remember sounds and I remember uh, like a feeling in the back of my neck. That's really all I remember. I don't really remember the actual thing I was looking at. Like people are like, oh, did it have, how many lights did it have? Uh, I think three. I'm not positive. Right. Or did it have like metal on it? I don't know. I, I, I couldn't see the stars behind what I was seeing, but I don't know if it was metal. Like I didn't touch it. I didn't throw a rock at it. I just, I remember feeling certain things and that's really about it. Yeah. Yeah. And as an in general, as far as telling the story, it's those big words that I know what I saw. Uh, I mean, I do know what I saw and I know that you know what you saw as far as every little detail that stuff is it's gone i mean i wouldn't ever uh, make something up just to oh well your shadow person story is a little general a and little boring off. well <laughs> yeah you're like well you know it happened a really long time ago and that's as best i can do i, I will never you know try to fill in something to to make a fantastical story exactly i couldn't agree more well i mean in terms of into the fray now i'm sure a hun- over 100 episodes in now including you do uh itf auxiliary which is really cool it's like a break off of ITF where you you have more room to to cover more topics that aren't necessarily part of the main shows. You've also got ITF Insiders, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But in terms of the main show, Shannon, I'm sure 100 episodes in, there've got to be some that really stick out to you. So I would love if you we could do sort of the highlights. Let's go ESPN on this. <laughs> uh, sports it's red center. zone time. <laughs> yeah. What are maybe let's let's go with three. Let's cover three of your favorite episodes that you've had so far, Um, whether it's the topic you covered, the person you interviewed. um, What really stands out to you and made you say, holy shit, this is why I started the show and this is why I'm going to keep doing it. Yeah. And it's it's really hard because you're not the first to ask, well, what's your favorite or favorites? And it's like picking your favorite kid, which you're never supposed to do. It's really very difficult. But yeah, I'll I'll pick kind of three of the most impactful and some of my tops at least uh i'm not going to say favorites because then i i'm like oh they're all they're all my course, my little yeah. babies you know <laughs> yeah so starting right out of the gate since we were discussing my love of bigfoot i think that when david came on for episode six and that is entitled Boundaries Crossed. His story, he had never told but a few people, and he certainly hadn't been on any shows talking about this. And why he chose me, I'm not sure. I'm very, you know, grateful that he did, and I'm able to get his story out there. That is not his real name. Uh, That will be kept a secret, and so will the the location and even the state. Uh, That all was uh, anonymous as far as uh, his, his story goes. But Okay, so for David, in 2001, he had been researching with this big name researcher for a number of years, and it was basically his mentor. And he and his mentor are in this location, this general area, and the mentor says, he pulls out a topographic map and he says, David, you you cannot go here. And he draws a red circle. And, you know, Dave's like, why? Why can't I go there? And the mentor tells him, well, I mean, that's their home. This is where they live. You do not go there. That would be a place you wouldn't want to be. And Dave's like, oh, okay. Yeah, no, I won't go there. Well, David decides he goes home and he lives about six hours from this location. He goes home and I think it's within a quite, uh, quite a short amount of time. He decides that he's going to tell his wife that he's going on a business trip, which at the time he says is not it's not abnormal because he used to do that kind of a thing for his work. So, OK, wifey going on a business trip. He doesn't tell anybody where he's going, which is like rule number one. If you're going camping or hiking or you've got to tell somebody Well, yeah. he doesn't doesn't tell a soul, uh, especially since he doesn't want his mentor to find out he's going to the, the old red circle zone. So he gets there and he pulls out the map and he figures, OK, I think I'm I'm in the red circle. I'm where I need to be. 
he gets in there, he sits down, and I believe he's sitting against, he's got his back against a, a boulder or a tree. I'm sorry, I forget now which one it was. But behind that is a ravine, and then in front of him is all the woods, and he says off to his right a little ways through uh, through the foliage is the trail that he came out or came in on. So he's sitting there and he's like, I'm actually getting kind of bored because there's nothing going on, nothing at all. <laughs> he goes, well, I drove all the way out here and, you know, it's pretty peaceful. So I think I'll just close my eyes for a bit and I could camp here all night, just sleep here and then and then drive out in the morning and no one's the wiser. Nobody's going to miss me. And he ends up falling asleep. He starts to hear. I think he's he's uh, woken by a little rustling at first. And then he wakes up and he says that he can hear now the loudest scream he's ever heard in his life. He goes, when people talk about Bigfoot screaming or possible Big Feetses screaming, <laughs> he says um, they liken it to a woman being murdered. And he goes, yeah, it's like that times 100. And he goes, I felt like it was within feet of me. And it's it's dark. It's pitch black. He said he could barely see his hand in front of his face. I should have mentioned that before. Sorry. Yeah, it's it's dark at this point now. Okay. The screaming starts and he turns his flashlight on. Now, I'm breezing through this quite easily, but that's because we know why, right, Ryan? Because it's not my story. Right. If you listen to David retell this, he's he's having a hard time with it. He turns his flashlight on and he goes, it's funny because this thing just keeps screaming and then another one starts, and he thought for almost certain there was a third one somewhere screaming at him. And he's not moving. He turns his flashlight on, and he goes, I went out there for Bigfoot, and I got Bigfoot, but I did not want to shine the light up to where I thought the screams were coming from because I didn't think I could handle seeing what was screaming. <sighs> wow. Yeah, and the other thought that's going through his mind is, oh, my God. He's like, I have kids. I've got a wife. Nobody knows where I am. He goes, my friends, even my wife, has laughed at me for believing in Bigfoot, and now I'm going to get killed by Bigfoot. <laughs> and, right, like the very thing that everybody laughs at me for is going to kill me, and no one's even going to find out about it. And he wasn't saying that in a, a poor me, like, yeah, oh, they didn't yeah. believe me. He was just like, I mean, I'm in some serious shit here, basically. Basically. So and at this point, I'm like, it's taken a long time to get to this point. I encourage everyone just to go listen to David's story. But he he decides that, all right, they're just going to keep screaming at me. And I don't think that they did a whole lot of moving at that point, And neither did he. He decides he this is when I went, holy cow. He crawls on his hands and his knees through the brambles and all the nasty stuff that's on the ground where he is at. Uh and he crawls back out to the trail. The entire time, these creatures, if we're assuming they're Bigfoot, are screaming at him. He says it was a good little ways. And he's he's crawling on his hands and his knees. And he makes it out to the trail. And he does get to this trail. And he forces himself to do a fast walk. Because he says, I feel like if I ran, they were going to chase me down. They were... You know, ways who amped up to be running away from him. He said they paralleled him the whole time. And he got he did. He made it back to his truck. And he said he, he shut the door of the truck. And he says, I don't, I'm not embarrassed to tell you that I was sobbing. He said, I was sobbing like a baby. Um, I thought I was going to die. And, you know, the irony is I went out there for it. And I got exactly what I was looking for. So he had to drive home and explain to his wife why he was all scratched up. Which I, I don't think he ever did tell me, you know, what he told her we didn't get into that side mm -hmm. of once he got home uh because it was difficult enough for him to get through what he had already told me but yeah moral of the story is if a mentor draws a red circle you don't go into the red circle and at least tell someone where you are so yeah i mean I, that was six episodes in of into the fray and i'm just going i mean this is why I want to do this because once he did tell the story and it was just he and I talking afterward, I could tell he, he was, you know, it's like, thank you for letting me do that. Thank you for listening. And I can tell you to this day, I keep in contact with him and he reiterates, I, there's not a day that goes by that it doesn't cross my mind, at least for a fleeting second. He goes, I don't dwell on it. I don't really lose sleep over it anymore, but it profoundly affected me. He goes, I really thought I was in mortal danger. 
Wow. Yeah. And I mean, again, like you said, six episodes in that that would only make me want to hear more stories. But the fact that a lot lot of people don't realize that before we hit record, like there there's talk with these people beforehand of like, what are the boundaries? Uh, You know, if you need to stop or anything or if this isn't going the way you want, like, just let us know. Like, there's a lot that goes in it before we actually push that record button. And I can only imagine how difficult it was for this grown man to admit, you know, like many men, that he was scared for his life and yeah. that he ended up in that truck. I'm I, I'm seeing it in my mind now, just sobbing about what just happened to him. He was in mortal danger. I The moment you said he was crawling and they continued screaming all around him, that seems like a personal hell to me. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that would be like torture. You're just waiting for them to pounce on you. I mean, assuming that that is what they were, right? Is some massive creature that could just use you as a Louisville slugger against a tree at any time. No matter what it was, just the fact that some sort of predator was out there in the dark, basically showing you, don't come back here again. (laughs) You know, I I can't imagine. Yeah. And I think they they got their message across. Uh, Absolutely. I, I think you did too. Don't go into the red circle. Goodness me. I mean, when I was in when I was in Salt Fork with a, a camp and trip situation and we're doing, you know, silly like finding Bigfoot stuff to oh yeah, we're gonna, gonna see what happens here. It was it was funny. It was it was hilarious because I'm like, Oh my god, we're literally doing stuff from finding Bigfoot. But I mean that everyone's heard me tell the whistle story. But I I mean, that was a freaking whistle and I was standing and I went to a crouching position because that's just what my instincts told me to do. It scared the shit out of me. Mm -hmm. And because it was just so it sounded so powerful. I'm like, what is out here with lungs that big and friggin lip? Gee, I don't know. (laughs) I mean, but that was a whistle. So this poor guy, I mean, getting screamed at by what he said, it was at least three of them. And they're shadowing you the whole time, which I said, man, that sounds really like a tactical move. And he goes, it was. I mean, they're you know, they're following me. And he goes, the second I would stop moving, because he would, when he was doing his fast walk, he would stop for just a second and and see if he could kind of get a peg on where they were, if they would keep walking, but they would stop instantly. The Mm -hmm. second he would stop. Right. Very interesting. So it seems uh, like a battle of wits. You know, he, he was smart to do what he did. And they, they were, unfortunately, you know, it seemed a step ahead of him the whole time, but at least he made it back to the truck. Thank God. Yeah. And that's the whole, that's the toughest thing about it, because that's what he went out there for right yeah. i mean how many times i've i've gone into the woods countless number of times and i'm like oh i'd love to see a big bud or but to be honest with you hey probably wet yourself i don't care how <laughs> you know close or far if you saw one and you knew for a fact what it was it couldn't be anything else let's just assume right yeah. there's just no other explanation you'd, you'd need a freaking diaper period i'm sorry like it's, i don't care how benign it is that's an ins- i mean when you really stop to think about it to actually see and he didn't see one, but his, you know, his, his account was uh, terrifying. But to actually see one would yeah. be insane. Absolutely insane. Yeah, I, I always tell people when they say like, oh, I want to get abducted by aliens or I want to see a mm-hmm. UFO. No, you don't. You, you really don't. Trust me on that. I remember when I interviewed you and I wasn't expecting the answer. I said, well, OK, we saw this UFO. You're a UFO researcher. Do you want to see one again? You're like, no. Absolutely. Like without, you know, any hesitation, like, no, I'm good. I don't need to see another one. And I was like, oh, I wasn't expecting that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and to be honest, in that moment, I think you caught me at my most vulnerable. Like I just recalled the event and yeah. I, I'm I would be totally fine never seeing it again. I, I had my moment of validity that these things are right. real. No matter what they are. I, I'm not even saying what I saw was alien. It easily could have been some sort of military training exercise or something, but it scared the living daylights out of me. It turned into an obsession after that in looking into all of these topics and sent me on this path. But no, I'd be totally fine never seeing it again. If I do, cool. Uh if someone wants me to go out and look for something, maybe I will, but no, I don't personally want to see that again. I've had my perception changed. I've had that moment of, whoa, everything is not what we think it is. And uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's kind of where it left me. Wow. OK, so we've got episode six. What What's what's another one that really stuck out to you? Uh, no, this is another and I hate to. You know, I'm not trying to add any more mystery to these or to my show or to myself, but this is another uh, anonymous person in an anonymous location. In fact, I don't even think that I was calling him by any name whatsoever. I can't even remember now. Oh, wow. uh, That's got to be uh, tough. Yeah. And this is another one where, 
you know, he, and like you said, you know, with recalling your story and you were at a vulnerable moment, I totally get that because when I was first on Sasquatch Chronicles and then show notes, I wasn't really talking about my experience at all. The first time I told it in full was on, I'm the worst, episode five, my own show. I can't even, <laughs> what the hell? Steve Stockton, mm -hmm. uh, Strange Things in the Woods episode was where I told it in full. And I had a tough time getting through that. Uh, but I will say that, and I've said this many times, <laughs> shadow people like to show up in your damn house and in your freaking bedroom. Mm -hmm. And if it had been that and not what I had during the day, grew that. I feel horrible for people that have something going on in their house because that is supposed to be your safe place. Those little punks uh, that they have no right to be going and standing in some freaking corner of your bedroom, which Sam's even had that happen. I think he had one like crouching by his bed and yeah, his girlfriend yeah. saw something at the end of the bed one time. I'm like, oh, that's no, that's a big bag of no, right there. Mm -mm. All right. <clears throat> so sorry, I digressed again. So this is episode 85, and it is entitled An Unfounded Call. This incident took place in 2009, and this is a, a sheriff's deputy. At this point in time, he is no longer a sheriff's deputy, and it is because of this incident. So there is an abandoned house in this place, and for some reason, the dispatch kept getting called out to this abandoned house. And when you get called out to a place that, you know, that there really shouldn't be calls coming from or there's no reason to really be there, they call it an unfounded call. And there's a code for it. I just I don't remember what the what the three numbers is for that, but it's called an unfounded call. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> he is he works night shifts. I think he said he started his shifts shortly before the sun would go down and then work mostly through the night. So on this particular night, they get another 911 call from this house and it's a hang up. So he has to go out there. He's been out there a few times, and every time he goes out, he's like, okay, there's nothing going on. Let's just get on with my night. Well, on this particular night, he gets called out there. He goes to the back porch and looks in the sliding glass door, and he actually does see a figure walking up the stairs. And he goes, oh, my God, there's actually somebody here. <clears throat> it proceeds to go all the way up the stairs. So he grabs onto the back door and it is open. So he does what he's supposed to do in that situation. And he calls for radio silence so that someone's not just coming over the radio and giving away the fact that he's in the house. He needs it quiet. I guess uh, the, the way that works is I think that they can still listen in. I'm not quite sure about that, um, mm -hmm. but he needed it quiet on his end. So he pulls out his flashlight. He goes upstairs and he searches a couple of rooms and there's nothing there. One of the last rooms he goes into, uh, the radio goes out, the flashlight goes out and he's like, oh, OK, that's a little weird. I, I remember him saying that he actually was hitting the flashlight at one point trying to get it to come back on. He enters the room fully. He sees on the far side of the room, and this description just gave me chills because I wasn't, keep in mind that when I'm recording this for his episode, I didn't have any idea what was coming. And sometimes I like that. Uh, it doesn't always make for the best interview because I don't have any stuff ahead of time. But then again, I, I was flabbergasted. So this is the first time I was hearing this is what, what got recorded for episode 85. So he goes into the room and he sees a dark figure as tall as the ceiling. And I remember him saying that he goes, Shannon, it was a lot like what you mentioned in your encounter, that it was like the deepest, darkest, blackest, you know, night. And it was even darker than that somehow. And it was as tall as the ceiling. I'm like, OK, wow. So he thinks, OK, this is kind of weird, but I'm going to identify myself as an officer of the law and you need to stay where you are. There's no response. The figure begins moving very slowly towards him. And now this gets a little bit more into maybe your realm of things, Ryan. Mm -hmm. uh, figure moves slowly towards him but then the next thing he remembers he is in his patrol car again and he's driving down a des desolate road maybe a half and a mile from this house mm -hmm. so he doesn't remember leaving the room he doesn't remember what happened with the shadow figure doesn't remember getting in the patrol car he just wakes up and he's driving on the road yeah that sounds familiar doesn't it a little bit i've run yeah. across that a few times yeah Shortly thereafter, of course, he's hearing his radio getting blown up. He's like, are you OK? Are you OK? And he gives the code saying, yes, I'm fine. But then he notices he's getting this intense uh, ringing in his ear. and He's very dizzy and lightheaded. So he decides he's going to pull the car over. He's like, so, you know, something's really wrong here. So he calls his sergeant. And he says, um, hey, man, I, I, I'm not feeling good. I think I might pass out. He locks his 
his gun in the trunk in case he does pass out. Some wacko comes by, you know, he's not just sitting there with a gun. And so he waits for the, the deputies to arrive to his location. Uh, I don't think he passes out again at that point. There's no other missing time. So he does stay awake. The deputies get there. They proceed to take him to the hospital. And he goes home. He's released. Everything seems okay. He's still a little dizzy and shaken up. The next day, and this is another big tie-in with a lot of things that we hear of. The very next morning, I think it was 5 or 5.30, really early, he gets a knock on the door and it's two guys in black suits and sunglasses and they're telling him, you need to sign these papers, you've been released from duty, Uh, this is not disciplinary, you can get your job back someday, you can reapply, it's really no problem, just sign these papers. He did, he did admit that he's like, I was young, I was really naive, I was very intimidated and I'm going through a lot of traumatic stuff, you know, from the night before and I still feel a little strange, so I signed the papers. But he did have a, I guess they gave him a, you know, a copy of it or whatever. Mm -hmm. And he hands over his badge and his his gun and all the things that he needs to do his job to these guys because he's assuming that he just got he just got let go. So the day keeps going through and the next night, next day, one of his fellow sheriff's deputies calls and he's like, dude, why didn't you show up for your shift last night? Like, what, what is this no call, no call or no show BS, right? Mm-hmm. And he's like, what are you talking about? And I was, he's like, I just I signed release papers and. I, you guys let me go. What the hell are you talking about? And the guy's like, um, no, we, we didn't release you. And in fact, the the captain is getting ready to press charges on you because of it. It's like stolen property. I mean, you can't just, uh, take a, an issue gun and badges and all that kind of stuff. That can be a a dangerous situation. So he's like, well, the captain's going to press charges. So you better produce that sheet of paper that you sign saying that we released you or you're going to have serious problems. You got, it gave him like half hour, 45 minutes. And he said that he and his wife tore the house apart. They couldn't find that paper. He's like, I just signed the damn thing yesterday. I have no idea where it went. And to this day, I don't think he's ever found that, by the way. At this point, he gets a phone call shortly after. I think it's around an hour later. And they're still trying to tear the house apart for this sheet of paper. He gets a phone call from his captain or that same gentleman, his friend, and said that, and this is all they said, which is strange. He said, county called, you're good. They they have your badge. They have your badge. They have your gun. You're off the hook. You're fine. Don't worry about it. His, his job wasn't fine, but mm-hmm. they weren't going to press charges. So... I, I mean, a uh, little, little strange there. You're like, oh, county called, and they have yeah. your, they have your badges, but they, you know, they, I, I don't. Anyway, that, that's, that is the main portion of that story. But this gentleman still to this day has, he has health issues involved with this. So you remember the, uh, the, the dizziness and the ringing in the ears. He has a, a blockage in his left ear, and that was confirmed through MRI. And, and before I go on, but let me interject here really quickly before I forget that. I personally have seen the paperwork and he did in fact work for the sheriff's department and you know, that was uh, verified uh, through myself. So uh, yeah, I meant to say that in the beginning. Sorry. So yeah, he's got a blockage in his left ear, continuous, continued, I should say, dizziness and lightheadedness. And he actually has experienced some pretty significant hearing loss in that left ear. So yeah, you've got, you know, the strange figure, which is, it seems very like ghosty paranormal uh, goes there to missing time and a very nefarious letting go of one's uh, job with law enforcement and now ongoing health issues. He says that he's tried to reapply like they said that he could. Whoever those two men were said he could reapply. So he has tried to do that. And anytime he goes to another department, he will not get hired because the previous department he was with, uh, they wouldn't disclose why they let him go. Wow. So he cannot get a job as a law enforcement officer at this time. Oh, my God. That's so sad. I mean, the guy's yeah. sort of based his life around wanting to serve and protect. And then the moment he's thrust into, like, clearly an unexplainable situation, uh, they just turn their backs on him. You have to wonder, like, how far up it goes. Right, exactly. And, I mean, the guys from county and then the two, I I remember asking him when I was talking to him, because he was the one that first mentioned, he goes, they look classic men in black, these, you know, very crisp, clean suits and sunglasses. Uh, And I even asked him, well, what were they driving? And he didn't remember. But, you know, it's just these little things that they keep adding up. But there's so many elements of that story. I was just sitting there going, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to process all this. And I don't. 
really know where to go with it. I mean, what what do you what are your first instincts on that kind of a story? Well, I mean, to me, this was an abduction experience, except for the beginning of it, which uh, I'm I'm also speechless. Like y- you don't you don't often see something that would appear at first sight to be supernatural, uh, mm-hmm. then turn into a almost prototypical abduction experience, uh, followed by Men in Black. It, it's it's very interesting. And who am I to say? that that's not the case it doesn't these things are all interconnected somehow we always bring this up yes later, in almost every conversation between us is it doesn't have to just be an alien experience or a ghost experience like these things can often intermingle and just be a plethora mixing what do you call it a, a melting pot of just weird yeah it's a shit show basically it is <laughs> you know what's interesting the the loud ringing that he heard I remember having that experience with mine. Like I said, my senses were in overdrive. I remembered sounds Mm. and I remembered feelings. Uh, I remember hearing a very, a vibration through my body, but also a ringing in my ears. And ever since, maybe I had this all my life. I, I don't know. I'd have to ask my parents. But ever since that event, I am almost... I would say maybe 80% deaf in my right ear. It's terrible. Like really? I, if if you're talking to me on my right side, it's almost as if you don't exist. And oh. it's it's gotten worse. I've had um a lot of ear problems, hearing problems as I've grown older, but I I don't want to make a connection if it truly isn't one, but that stuck out to me when you mentioned that that he he yeah. his his hearing deteriorated ever since then. I can sort of relate to that. Again, maybe it's connected, maybe not, but that that's very interesting. Wow, yeah. Um and I don't think I've ever told anyone that, to be I, honest. I was this just may be a tra- first. Yeah. <laughs> I was just trying to think. I was like I was just gonna ask you, have you said that before? Because I don't remember hearing that. That's wow. Yeah, yeah. So again, if it was due to that event, I'm kind of reluctant that it happened. But at the same time, I wouldn't trade it for anything. It's sort of still sent me on this path. And, you know, that's what hearing aids are for, I guess. Man, yeah, I'm I'm sorry to hear that. I didn't even realize. I mean, yeah, like you said, you don't want to jump and make an automatic connection there. But I mean, you can't help but kind of think, especially when you hear similar stories. Absolutely. And that happens all the time. We we find people who have had similar experiences and it's like, oh, my God, I got to talk to them. Like, I'm no longer alone. It, that's that's right. the one thing that I think uh, a lot of people who are willing to come forward and tell their stories, they're looking for closure or they're looking for someone to relate to. And I think that's extremely important, you know, and and I, I think that's great that people have outlets to tell their stories or inspire them to start their own. You know, we are good friends, Vance and Jennifer, who um, were listeners of ours for the longest time. They now have their own show where they're also doing this and they've had their own experiences. And we're all like this big community of people who are just trying to, I don't even know if I want to say find answers because I don't know if we ever will, as depressing right. as that sounds. I honestly don't think we will. I think these are mysteries that will be with us till, uh, you know, unfortunately, that day we leave this plane. But uh, maybe we'll find those answers in the afterlife if there is one. But yeah, it's... I've made friends and I've made such close connections with people that I never would have talked to in my daily life except for these profound experiences they've all had. So, wow. Yeah, that, that was... That one shook me up a little. I don't know what to make of it. I'm speechless as well. And Ryan, I wanted to yeah. ask you, because you you brought up the whole interconnectivity. There's got to be something. I've been, you know, I, I say that too. I'm like, there's got to be a lot more tie-ins to, I don't think that this is completely separate from this and this is completely separate from that. There's got to be some threads there. What do you make of the folks who, they might wake up in their bedroom and there's grays, the quintessential classic gray in their bedroom and they say something like in the name of jesus you need to go you know get out of my house or whatever and it works why would a gray alien give a shit if somebody mentions the name jesus christ that's a really good question and we actually on an episode of into the fray we spoke to patty uh i I, do you remember that the woman who came on to talk about with her daughters so she had a triangular ufo experience with her daughters it then turned into a plethora of stuff they started seeing beings walking through their home uh almost like prototypical gray aliens demonic sort of stuff 
poltergeist stuff happening within the home. It was crazy. Again, just like everything thrown at them. Yeah. And their way of dealing with it, they it sort of alienated the daughters from the mother for a long time. They didn't talk to one another. But what brought them back together was prayer. They, they were spiritual. I believe they were Christian. And they started praying for these things to go away. And for the daughters, it did. So... The mother still has some experiences, but at least her daughters were safe or at least felt safe. And we do hear this often. The power of prayer can do amazing things. And whether it's just a a state of mind that you're being positive and you're you're believing so much in something that you can actually manifest it, that that's very possible in terms of if these greys in someone's bedroom are demonic. I, I don't know. I, I can't honestly say that. Uh, I don't personally believe that. I don't think that um, that it, that has anything to do with this. But for anyone who does believe that, all the power to you. And if if God is going to be your thing to if this if this is horrible and you don't want to experience it and God is there for you. Awesome. You know, use him, use him for right. use right. it. But I, I honestly don't know. I've had people ask me, like, what the hell would an alien gray like care about you praying? Like and you know, it's funny. When I was a kid, I went to confession. I don't know if I've told you this story before. I might have. I went to confession. I, I, I was born, I was raised Roman Catholic. And I got in there. I said a few of my weekly, you know, sins that I was there to confess. And then I asked the priest, hey, what's up with aliens? Like, what do you think about that? What's? And I really threw him off guard. And it's kind of funny because I think within that small congregation at church, people did know that I was into this sort of stuff. I would bring it up no matter where I was. My mom would always shut me up. But uh, <laughs> That's great. I went in there. I asked him and he laughed and he's like, is this Ryan? <laughs> you know, because you got the partition there. You can't right. See um, and then he was so good about it. He was like, you know what, Ryan? I'll, I'll entertain this. He's like, the Catholic Church has no stance on if aliens are real or not. He said, but personally, I believe that if God was all powerful and created everything, that of course he would create other worlds with other life to, uh, it only shows the vastness of God's power. And you know what? That, that was, that really stuck with me. No matter where my faith brought me as I grew older, that's a completely yeah. different different story but i respected that yeah maybe if there is a god maybe he did create these aliens maybe they're here to do their thing experiment with us to have some galactic federation someday i i honestly don't know do i believe they're demonic and a uh, demonic in nature no i do not i i don't believe that they may lack empathy they may lack ethics that we have here on planet earth but i do not believe they're some manifested source of pure evil we've seen that on this planet many times but i don't believe it's coming from other planets no that was really cool that he did like you said entertain that thought and, and go down that vein with you for, yeah. for a quick moment um you know what's really interesting though is they say that we are created in God's likeness, right? Mm -hmm. So what does that say if he did create aliens or the greys or the Nordics? Or yeah. is this a Prometheus kind of a situation, right? Where they came first and then they created us, but then... I, yeah. I don't know. It, it's quite the rabbit hole, but uh -huh. it is. And it's just a constant just loop of uncertainty. You know, if we do say God created in our image, if that's the case, then, you know, God is looks like us. He's got two hands, two feet, legs, everything um, that that seems odd to me. You know, we we I only agree. we perceive everything through human eyes and what we've experienced as we've evolved. You know, maybe God is some sort of chameleon and can be anything that it wants to be as long as we can handle it you know that's maybe it's more like it you know yeah. the, the horrible cgi in it and i still don't know <laughs> what it looks like because i haven't gotten to the end of the book uh and of course this movie we didn't cover that but yeah i'm just i'm totally on board with that what you're saying i just find it hard to believe if it, that he's actually got a human shape if yeah. he's out there yeah, I would have to agree. I, I don't know. And a lot of people mention the screen memories when they have these abduction experiences that whatever these aliens are, they will take a form that you are familiar with to comfort you, uh, to make it easier to for your brain to sort of process. And then they'll strip you of that memory right after. Right. Then you're like, well, what the hell is the point of? I, yeah, I'm, I don't know. Yeah. Then it, it should have just it, why don't you just show up like the you're you supposed are. to show up. Yeah, nope, just I'm be who you. you be. 
Just be you, alien. Just be you. <laughs> you be you and I'll be me. You're going to screen memory me anyway. Exactly. He's like, Kay, did you just flashy thing me? Kay. <laughs> yeah. You know what's funny? Uh, I ha- I remember talking to Mike Cleland about the uh, the owls in Alien Abductees. And mm-hmm. he did mention there are many cases he's come across where aliens seem to be pretty bumbling at times. They they aren't mm-hmm. perfect. No, Even if they traveled here from so many light years away... And and they seem to be so far advanced, like they're gonna they're gonna screw up every now and again. Look at people of Earth on TBS. <laughs> Those aliens are so <laughs> stupid. Yeah. Yeah. Who yeah. knows? Who knows? Hey guys, I have to interrupt this week's interview for just a moment to remind you once again that Somewhere in the Skies is brought to you by the amazing folks over at HelloFresh. Next time you're listening to the show while making your delicious, healthy HelloFresh meal, be sure to tell a friend about the amazing offer we're currently giving away. By using the promo code SOMEWHERE50, new HelloFresh members will receive 50% off their first box. And trust me guys, I tried three of their amazing vegetarian dinners, and I was instantly hooked. It's fast, it's easy, and in under a half hour, you have a meal the whole family will enjoy. Consider HelloFresh today by visiting hellofresh.ca and again using the promo code SOMEWHERE50, courtesy of your friends at the Antica Podcast Network and HelloFresh. And now, back to the show. Well, let's let's do one more if you if you if you're up for it. Um would love to. Yeah, you got another one for us? What do you got? So th- this is um this is something that happened recently uh, okay. for me and uh, talking about the threads and the tie-ins and this one really took me down a large rabbit hole that I really I wasn't expecting which was nice uh, and that had to do with the fae oh, and the okay. fae folk fairies and I that sounds it sounds very giggly especially when you say fairies but these fairies are not the uh, flitting about the flowers and um it was seeding the earth with loveliness and and light. Um, these are some pretty nasty things if we're to believe that they are out there. So this was episode 103, and it initially started because a lady named Pam called in on episode 100, which was entitled Frayed Lines. And if you want to hear her original, it was when she called into the hotline, she told a couple stories of her growing up with the fae, or at least what she can best classify as fae folk. So 103 comes around, and I ended up talking to Pam myself, and we talked for a good long while, and one of the stories, and, and this was in episode 100 on the recording, but I had her tell it again so I could, you know, do the old picking apart and asking questions of him. And one of these little fey folk she remembers seeing when she was very young, I think she was four or five, and this little dude, when we're talking about why would an alien give a shit about the name Jesus Christ, this is funny to me because she said this little man, little meaning really, really little. Mm -hmm. like (laughs) Literally. Yeah, yeah. I'm not trying to get any political correctness here. He was a really (laughs) tiny little man. He had the clothes on and he had a little pouch. And she said, I don't know what was in the pouch, but he had a little pouch on, a little leather pouch over his, like slung over his shoulder or something and little clothes. And I'm thinking, why the hell would this little dude give a crap about wearing clothes? He's, you know, like two feet tall. But anyhow, she's at her grandmother's house and she's playing in the dirt with this little jewelry box. And what's in the jewelry box is like fake plastic jewelry with like plastic jewels and little necklaces. And she said as she's playing with this, this little dude is just enamored with the jewelry. And she ended up burying the box at one point and going back and it was gone out of the ground. And she, to this day, you know, I asked her, well, where'd that box go with the jewelry that the little man loves so much? She goes, I don't know. It's kind of, I go, maybe it's in some, some other realm, other dimension with the fey folk. Right. And you know, that's just me trying to lighten up the mood because this woman, um, had a lot of really difficult experiences with what she considers the fey and she's got an Irish background and her great grandmother was what People called her a Banfessa, which is basically a witch. And she, I don't think that this woman would dabble in a, you know, a lot of dark stuff or anything, but I guess she just wasn't very kind to people from what Pam said. So people called her a witch. Certain members of her family also would see horned creatures and hooved creatures. Her grandmother was asked at one point when she was out tending to some. Uh, cattle on their property she was carrying something 
and there was supposedly this horned and hoofed creature sitting on a fence and it asked her if her load was heavy. You know, like, do you need help? Your load looks heavy. And being taught from when she was a little girl, you never, ever, you, you just want to ignore them. You don't want to talk to them. And if they offer help, my God, you don't take it. So she's like, nope, I'm good. And just books it. And that was the end of that story. Also, something that happened, and I should have written this down. I should have gone back in and looked. I apologize. She went to Ireland uh, a number of years ago. And she and a friend are walking through this forest somewhere in Ireland. And even though she's terrified of the Fae, and I skipped over a story, uh, but it's for a reason. I'll come back to it. But... She decided to go to Ireland, even though she's terrified of these things, and kind of face her fear and be like, I got this. I'll just do what I normally do. Do what I was taught. Ignore them. They won't bother you. A friend is throwing some coins down on the ground uh, for some, you know, reason uh, I cannot remember at this time. And Pam was just going along her merry way. And at some point, she, her vision gets hazy. So hazy that she can't see what's in front of her. And she said her hearing changed. It was like she wasn't where she knew she was supposed to be. And a, a, some kind of a serpent looking creature came towards her. She basically said, I felt like I was, that was the end of me. And she was uh, very emotional when she was telling this story. It was uh, one of the more terrifying ones for her. And she w actually got out of that realm or that, that, uh, place, whatever you want to call it. She got out of there. Her vision was actually affected for almost a full day, I believe, after that happened. She's like, I don't know if it was because uh, of my friend throwing coins down, or maybe I wasn't, or I don't know what the deal was, but um, she, she feels like she can see these things. It doesn't happen all the time to her, but when it does, it can be really quite dramatic and traumatic. So this wasn't the only time that I talked to Pam. And on an insider episode, we had another almost two hour conversation where we we delved more into the background on the Fae, where they came from, the types of Fae, like a brownie, which is a, also a funny name. But <laughs> a brownie, I go, a brownie, it sounds like what was interested in all your jewelry. And she goes, yeah, it does sound like a brownie. And they have little little leather clothing on and pouches. And for the most part, they're pretty benign. Another phone call on episode 100 that she called in with was something that one of my listeners actually ended up doing a drawing for. And it is the episode image for episode 100. And it was a fae with long, scraggly black hair when sharp teeth. Why the hell they need sharp teeth? I don't know. And me and Pam laughed about this. I'm like, you don't need sharp teeth unless you're just ripping flesh from bone, I guess. Yeah. But yeah, so this fae is sitting in a river, and she can see it. But now, keep in mind, she was always taught if you see one, you don't give it any attention, you don't look at it, you don't know that you can see it. You're, so she's sitting there fishing on, on a rock in this river, and she's trying to ignore this damn fae. Unfortunately, she sees two little boys and their father, and she actually sees them pointing right at the fae. She's like, oh, holy shit, they can see that thing. And... Obviously, she's going, I don't think the dad can because, you know, they're two little kids and this thing with the sharp teeth and it's in the river and they're going right for it. And she's going, oh, my God, I'm going to have to call out to to these people or tell the dad to get away or so I have to do something. I can't do what I normally do and just be on the down low. And they get down closer to the river. And thankfully, the dad just kind of at some point. I think something just diverted their attention and away they went, right? So that that was there wasn't like this big dramatic end to that story. But I, I think my point was and I asked her, I was like, I don't think the two little boys would go towards something if it looked the way that you saw it to yeah. look. I don't think that they would be pointing at it and giggling and laughing and being like, Ooh, ooh I wanna go see that. Dad, dad, let's go see. The assumption was the dad couldn't see it. I don't know what parent would Unless you really dislike your kids, you'd want them to go down towards something that looks like that. But these fade do seem to be able to shapeshift. And they do something called, it's called glamouring, basically. I put kind of like a little, little spell on you. And the reason I brought up the two-hour insider episode that recently got posted was because there are a lot of tie-ins. And you can't help, and here's the threads that I was talking about, with the missing 411 and the cases of of people going missing in the woods under 
very odd circumstances. And then sometimes just after years and years and years, they'll, I don't know, they'll find a shoe that looks perfectly normal right. and it did belong to that person. Or in one, one story, I think they did find a skull, which looked like it had just recently been devoid of, of tissue and flesh. And it had been supposedly in the woods for 20 years, whatever it was. I don't remember exactly. So don't quote me on that. But anyway, high strangeness, right? So keep in mind her story in Ireland of her feeling like she's in this other place. Her her vision is hazy and she's very disoriented. Oh, one of the things with the Fae, if you're stuck in a glamour situation in one of these little weird, I don't know, you're in another dimension, whatever the hell it is. If you're with the Fae and you want to get out of the situation, one of the ways to do that is to turn your clothes inside out. Now, I don't know <laughs> why that would do anything, but many, well, maybe not many, let's not over-exaggerate, Shannon, a number of the people and the kids, especially the kids, it seems, comes back from being missing wherever they were, their clothes are inside out. That's happened on, on numerous occasions as far as w what David has put in the books for Missing 411. So it kind of makes you wonder, like, well, yeah, that, that's kind of weird. Their clothes are inside out. So I was on that insert episode going, wait, Pam, are you telling me that they, if you are in a glamour situation with a fae trying to put the boogity on you, you turn your clothes inside out, you can get out of that? And you can come back to the quote unquote, our realm. She's like, yeah, I mean, that's part of the folklore. I'm like, what? <laughs> Why are you kidding me? Yeah. I, I was blown away. I mean, I'm not saying, I'm not saying, I'm only saying it's interesting. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. That's, oh man. The whole idea, the folkloric aspect to all this we often tend to shy away from, I guess. You know, we have the work of Jacques Vallée, who believes that a lot of what we consider alien is is fae, is, is, are these stories throughout the centuries of fairies and this and that. And it's evolved into this, this version of the ambiguous gray and it's alien now. It comes from another planet rather than, you know, within this magical realm or plane. It's, it's fascinating to me. Now that image that you have for the, that was made for this is mm -hmm. ter terrifying and yeah. not what you would necessarily think of when you think of the fae folk, you know? Um, so I think that's another big thing, too, is realizing that these things ain't little tinkerbells or anything like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. In fact, uh, to do a little research and Pam, she's so she's such a, a sweet person and we're friends now and we talk quite often. She sent me a bunch of books. One of them's even from Ireland because I'm like, I need to read more on this. I wasn't really that familiar with it, except for the very basics. And I also got a book from the library. Yes, I have libraries here in Las Vegas, everyone. It's weird, <laughs> right? I always make a joke about that. They're like, oh, yeah, you live in a hotel? No, no. Um, this is, it, it literally is titled Fairies 101. But when I sent the snap of some of the pictures inside to Pam, we were just dying laughing because all the fairies in this book are drawn. They look like Victoria's Secret models <laughs> with big like grins on their faces, just absolutely gorgeous, normal, normal, no sharp teeth, right? No big bug eyes or scraggly hair, beautiful flowing hair and wings. And they're flitting about the flowers. And there are ways to keep the fae away from your house. You, you know, there's iron and in horseshoes and and. and there's a tourmaline. Pam even sent me some of that stuff, which is so cool of her. But there are people that are writing entire blogs on how to invite them into your home. Here's what you plant or here's a chance you could do or whatever it might be. But and hey, to each their own. I'm not judging. I'm just saying that there are two completely different sides when it comes to the subject of the Fae. So I'm really looking forward to diving more into this. And she had other experiences as well. So I didn't want to touch on all of them and, and take up all of the time. But those were a couple of the, the more impactful ones for her. Yeah. And even to this day, and here's an interesting thing. I think this was on the Insider episode, actually. But when we were talking about it, at one point, her dog needed to go outside. And she's got some land and she is in, you know, near some woods and forest. And she does see these on her property, by the way. The dog has to go outside. She, she opens the door and she goes, she goes, um, I'm sorry, I'm not going to talk about them for just a minute here while this door is open. I mean, very adamant. It was not a, a funny or she wasn't trying to get me to giggle or anything. Yeah, yeah. She literally was like, I'm not going to speak about the Fae unless all the doors and windows are shut. And I mean, this is a, it's a terrifying thing for her. Yeah, right. Exactly. This again, it is not what we would often look at as folkloric in terms of like, 
pretty and magical. Like these things are terrifying and you have to wonder, you know, is the whole side of it, this Victoria's Secret, beautiful thing. It is it a ruse? Is, is that right. what they do to draw you in? Yeah, you have to wonder. I, I haven't listened to the Insider episode yet, but I really look forward to that. It seems like this woman has just had an undeniable amount of experiences with this. Yeah, and it does seem like a lot of things all, all across the board for anything strange that some some people are just more apt to see these things. And she definitely, whatever that might be, and we discussed that on the show too. Like I said, she's got her Irish background, and then she also has a certain amount of Native American blood. And that's all conjecture, right? Like we don't know. But it was all just points that we brought up just as an interesting point. So yeah. it does seem like – other some people are more apt to see these than others like the two boys they saw that thing mm -hmm. i don't think they saw what she saw but they saw something in the river they wanted to go down to but the dad they, i don't think he saw a damn thing so mm -hmm. yeah i think it is i think the more open you are the more it's going to invite itself into your your life in many ways and you're also all going to perceive it differently it's it's fascinating well i mean in terms of ITF Insider, Shannon. Let's let's sort of delve into that. Now, again, this is an offshoot of ITF. Uh, this is what you offer to people who want to experience a little bit more of what you're doing, bonus content. And one of those was an investigation that you went on uh, to Fox Hollow Farm. Now, I had no idea where this place was. I remember the morning you landed there, you sent me a picture and I was like, whoa, where are you? What is that? <laughs> and when I started digging into the story behind Fox Hollow Farm, Form, I was terrified. And this is one of the many things you offer at ITF Insiders. But I would love if you could sort of run us through what compelled you to go to Fox Hollow Farm and what did you find while you were there, if you don't mind sharing, even just no, a little bit. I would love bit. to. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, well, I mean, Fox Hollow Farm, to me, I've always known about it. I don't know when I first learned about Fox Hollow Farm, but as you mentioned, it's got a terrifying backstory. This is a beautiful home. It's a very large home in Carmel, Indiana. And it sits on wooded property. Much of the property is very open, um, clear cut. They've got some animals there, horses and such. But her Baumeister lived there. <laughs> okay, so this is a married man and they had children. And they were actually pretty well respected in the community. He owned a, a thriftway shop and, you know, he, he seems like an upstanding guy with with a wife and the kids. But when Julie Baumeister, his wife, would take the kids to, I think it was a state over, they had like a lake house. So Julie would take the kids a lot of times for weekends and Herb would stay back for, you know, work or at least what he said to Julie was he was working. What he would do is go down to downtown Indianapolis, down to the gay bars and lure young gay men back to Fox Hollow Farm. Uh, one of the accoutrements of Fox Hollow Farm is in the basement. There is an indoor pool. And he would say, hey, come back to uh, come back to the place and have a swim and a drink. And he would take them back there and drown them in the pool and proceed to bury them on his own property. There are confirmed 11 bodies, which I'm sure they have not found all the bones for. In fact, I know that because Robert Graves told me himself that Still to this day, if you dig around enough and you're patient enough and you dig deep enough, you will still find human remains. He showed me behind the house where the initial, I guess, quote unquote, body pile, if you want to call it that, was found. And it is shocking how close to the house this was. I would say from the back door, it was probably 25 feet, 30 feet. Mm -hmm. That's feet, not yards. Yeah. And this dude... He gave, uh, obviously, no Fs, right? So he he did end up being caught. He killed himself. And that was the end of the Herb Baumeister reign in downtown Indy and bringing them back to this beautiful property and killing them there and burying them there. And before I get into my time at, at the property, I just want to say that everyone should go Google Herb Baumeister, just local news, or type in raccoon video it is, if this doesn't give you a glimpse into the insane mind of these people, then nothing will. There is an interview of Herb Baumeister. He's in a suit, and he's he's on property at Fox Hollow Farm. He's at the end of the driveway, I can tell. It's a very, very long, winding driveway down to this beautiful home. And he's standing up by the road, by the main road. And 
I think the day before or two days before, there was a raccoon. Now the raccoon's already dead. Okay, it, mm-hmm. it's it's very flat, like a little pancake. Someone had the the guys that paint the road. Okay, the public service works had driven over the raccoon with paint. <sighs> Herbert Baumeister was outraged that this happened, and he called the news, and he is on camera just talking about how despicable and low it is for them to treat this raccoon this way and paint over its already dead body. Meanwhile, he is within yards of actual human beings that he has slaughtered and his, their families will never see them again. And it's just, it's, it's comical, but it's insane. And you're just going, this dude is for real. Like he is for real out of his mind. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I, I encourage everyone to, uh, to find that that little that little gem of Herbert Baumeister talking about that poor damn raccoon. Ugh, I don't know if I could stand watching. I, I whenever I come across serial killers, you know, I I have a play opening as we're recording this, literally tonight, opening in New York City about a serial killer. Yeah. So I did have to do a lot of research into that world, dig into their minds, blah blah blah. But actually going back and watching like interviews with Dahmer or Gacy or you know any of these guys, I. I have a very hard time. I only have such such a threshold to actually hear the person talking about what they did, seeing the lack of empathy within them, seeing those cold, dead eyes, you know, like what it, it's pure evil. Like we mentioned earlier, incarnate right here on Earth. Um, it, I, I, besides demons or the devil, the devil made me do it. No, you are deranged. You are a sick person. And this is what happened. So when I came across this one in Fox Hollow Farm and I saw that there was actual video of the guy, I couldn't do it, Shan. I just couldn't watch watch it but that video seems very uh, disturbing to think you know that he would he would say this about the raccoons and then go do what he did you know what i mean yeah just standing within however many feet or yards of of these people that he he had no yeah. regard for yeah. at all uh and yeah so the fox hollow farm itself i will say i i drove there during the day and I, I pull up to the place and of course I'm just, I'm floored. I couldn't even believe that I was there uh, after years and years of being very familiar with the story and what went on there. But in all of the content I decided to release just for insiders, that was a big trip for me, obviously. So I wanted to give that uh, exclusively for the insiders, but there's plenty of video of the property, of the pool. And I also spent time with Tony Harris, who is someone that spent time, a lot of time, with Herb Baumeister while he was still alive at Fox Hall Farm. And there's a, an episode featuring Tony. Uh, he would not let me record him on video, but I did get audio of him. And it just, it, it chills you to the bone because he does talk about some other locations where he feels or has seen you know, maybe some things that are, yeah, he, he talks about the stables. He feels like some stuff happened in the stables and also down. He always goes, you know, everybody talks about the pool, like the actual pool. Mm -hmm. And when you have an indoor pool, you have to keep it sequestered from everything else because, uh, you know, the, the humidity and the moisture will damage things. So where I slept was down in the basement just adjacent to the pool and the the way the pool is set up you you keep walking down this long hall on your left is the door that goes into the pool and that's all glass and then you keep walking down and there's another massive like like there's a pool table and another uh, little um, kitchenette area a bar area and a couple massive couches it's a it's a very large space but on that first night not only of course did I meet Rob Graves you have uh now Tony Harris came and went before everybody else showed up, he had some things to do, but I spent a good amount of time with him that first day. Rob Graves is the owner, Rob and Vicki Graves. And then uh, Joe LeBlanc is somebody that lived upstairs in, there's a whole nother apartment, uh, basically above the garage, but it's still attached to the house. You can still get to this from inside the house. He actually had an experience in the indoor pool where he felt someone drag him underwater and then actually 
felt fingers go around his neck, which her Baumeister did, in fact, strangle these men in the pool. That was his M.O. That's what he did. It was erotic to him. It, and, it, uh, you know, the, the control aspect, uh, that was his M.O. So Joe was over there. And then Brian Saunders, who is a medium, and I was, if I'm being honest, I was quite skeptical about that whole aspect of it, but he was incredible. Uh, he came up with some things that blew everybody away and that were verifiable. Uh, but that, that's a, I still am waiting to get him on into the fray. He's a busy guy, but he needs to come on with his, his side of it. I want to make that, um, a public episode and not just for insiders. So they all come over the first night and it's my first night at Fox hollow. I'm sitting there with Rob and Joe and Brian. And we're going through the house, telling all these stories are getting told. And Rob has an incredible amount of original material from when this happened. I will say there wasn't really a dark feeling in the house. I never got that. I will, I'll, I'm not going to you know, make it something it wasn't, at least to me. Uh, but I'll, I'm also not a very sensitive person when it comes to that. Even Rob Graves himself, we were chuckling because I'm like, I must be like Rob because I never see anything, you know, except for that <laughs> one that one time. And we're sitting around the, the old dining room table and I'm getting footage and I'm doing interviews and then everybody leaves and Rob goes upstairs, you know, to go to bed. And then I am sleeping down in the basement. So I go down to the basement and I pass the pool. I'm like, hey, Fox Auto Pool, how you doing? Okay. <laughs> and then I go and I go past there and I, I get my my bed set up on this nice big oversized couch and I lay down. And then there's a back door that goes to the backyard, which is right pretty much within 20 feet of where those bodies were found. And then you look over and part of half of the wall that divides from the pool to the room that I'm in is, in fact, glass. So I can see right through to the pool. I'm like, I just can't believe that I'm even here. This is insane. And I did leave. I did leave a recorder going every night, but nothing really came up as far as you know, what people call EVPs, the electronic voice phenomenon. I didn't get any of that. As far as I know, unless I'm blind and then everyone else who has seen the footage for Insider is blind, which I know we aren't, nothing was captured on camera. My feeling personally, gorgeous, gorgeous place. I didn't get any creepy feelings except for that first night when I it was just kind of all settling in, you know, that right. I was actually there and talking to Rob and, and Brian and Joe except for that, just setting the tone. I mean, the second night I slept like a baby. I, I didn't have any horrible dreams or I think it was just the, I hate to say nostalgic because that's usually a positive thing, but just the being in such a place that you've read about and seen on TV. And I, I am fascinated with serial killers. So for me to go to Fox Hollow Farm, I mean, that dude is and it's nothing to, to brag about, but he's in like top 10 lists anytime a top 10 list comes out yeah. because this is a dude that he was getting away with this for. In fact, there is, of course, talk that maybe he was the I-70 killer. So maybe there was more than the, the 11 that were found on his property. Right. So the, the body count for him is probably through the roof. So he is quite prolific. And the fact that he had the wife and the kids, all of this under the nose is... Um, of course, the question is, how did Julie not know? But uh, I don't know. I mean, you'll have to ask her that. You know, she's still around. And I, I did get to, Rob took me by her place. Or her, her place is actually, she moved back into the house that they moved out of to move into Fox Hollow Farm. She oh, and her. Wow. So she's back in that same place. And yeah, so I mean, the, the trip was amazing. I got a lot of great footage. I, I did try to do it justice as far as the fact that it, it is a somber place and it's, it's beautiful and the graves of family is so wonderful and nice. It's easy to not forget what happened, but I just, I, my basic down to what I get basic is I, I didn't have any profound experience, nor did I have any profound, you know, negative feelings or oppression or sadness um, while I was there. But right. although it was incredible to be there, but I will say, and I, I do think I have another invite to go out if I wanted to. And I, I do want to take them up on that because I, I feel like th this first time I, it was, I mean, that was, I went there alone. I didn't, it wasn't like me and a team or, you know, right. I don't have a team. So I just went there by myself and not that I was like 
nervous. I was by myself. I felt like, of course, it's a little different when the family is home. You know, it's not like you're going to some abandoned house. So I really felt like I was trying to be as respectful and out of the way as I could. But I think if I went back, I think I would be downstairs in the pool room being, you know, stand up till the middle of the night or all night if I had to, like taunting or, you know, really just imploring whatever it is to talk to me or talk to talk to the camera, talk to the Zoom recorder I have in my hand, whatever it might be. I really feel like I was I was more standoffish than I should have been. Mm-hmm. I, I was a r- really more reserved and shy, and I shouldn't have been because these folks, they're used to that kind of stuff uh, in that house. And Vicki Graves herself, you know, she saw the man with, if you've seen the Paranormal Witness episode, they did a pretty good job of it. And I think Rob and Vicki would both agree. That wasn't Fox Hollow Farm, though, of course. That was a place, I guess, up in Canada. But... Mm-hmm. Vicki Graves did see a man in a red shirt. He was an apparition, so he had no legs. And he was walking away from her, and he disappeared into the wood line behind the house. Or, I'm sorry, it was to the side of the house, and I actually have uh, footage of that, too, right where she saw that. And Joe LeBlanc, who had the experience in, in the pool, he also saw the man with no legs. And Joe's got a whole, like separate horror story of what was going on up in that apartment. And I I do think that the reason the apartment above the garage was so active for Joe is because I I found out that at at the end there, when Herb and Julie were not doing very good, he was, he was staying up there in that apartment. Right. So some of his last bits of time at Fox Hollow Farm was spent up in that apartment. Yeah. Hearing, seeing and experiencing, I can only imagine the worst of things. Yeah. Yeah, and hearing Joe retell what he went on, what he was going through in that apartment was just, I was sitting there, and that's that's on a video for insiders, and, and they can check that out, but he yeah. went through every detail of what he went through up in that apartment. It was not it was not a good thing, and like I say, it's a whole other thing when it's, it's in your safe space. Exactly. Uh, well, you know, I mean, as horrible and tragic as all of this was, it's good to know that you at least had a, a somewhat pleasant experience on beautiful land that was desecrated so badly by yeah. what, what occurred. But, you know, now that you've, you know, you know these people, you trust them, I I would imagine going back, you could really, really get into it and uh, see what you can come up with. I look forward I look forward to that, you going back and investigating. And in terms of that, do you have anything, any other investigations coming up for the insiders? Uh, now, I guess first, can you... Can you tell us how we can find insiders, the, your, your sort of elite version of ITF? Sure, yeah. If you go to the website, into the com, and then you just click become an insider, and it has a couple different options, the monthly or the the annual option there for you. So yeah, I mean, as far as the the content goes, I'm really trying to, I'm trying to get better at doing video. I have no video camera or any kind of a DSLR. I hope that someday, of course, I can uh, get the funds to do that. But with just the iPhone, I'm trying to do my best. So there's times when I'll get on the old iPhone and and shoot in as much 4K. Surely that's not 4K, though. It's kind of funny. <laughs> I, I laugh about that, but iPhone's like, it has 4K. I'm like, I don't think. Get a red camera. That's 4K, man. There you uh, go. Yeah, so I just try to do a lot of the things that get emailed to me never get released to the main show. A lot of the stories that I get will only be released for insiders. I mean, that's the idea, right, of the, the premium content side of things. So I really would like to get out and do more investigations. I kind of do have something that I want to, um, you know, announce one of these days very soon, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it does have to do with investigations here locally. So uh, hoping that would, of course, provide more uh, spooky content and maybe some actual evidence of some of these weird things that we talk about. I think that would be fantastic. And yeah, I think just, just plugging away, trying to get more of the personal stories which I'm always fishing for, always throwing that line out there for folks. So, yeah, if they ever wanted to, to talk to me about anything. And, again, doesn't have to be for the show. I always want to reiterate that. It's it's very much a community feel, and I don't want anyone to feel like, oh, well, I mean, if you contact Shannon, it's just because she wants you for downloads for Into the Fray. That's not it at all. I, I just I really do enjoy the, the banter with people and exchanging ideas. 
That could not be more true. I know you as a person, and I know that how much material actually doesn't make it onto the show, and how long you're willing to, you know, just sit down and speak to people. It's amazing. I wish I had the patience that you have. <laughs> I, oh, I find, that's yeah. not true at all. I mean, look at all the stuff you've accomplished since you got started in all this, Ryan. Oh, yeah. I, I, I can only listen to so much before I have to go out and have a couple of whiskeys, <laughs> but uh, that's very kind of you. Well, I want to toast a whiskey to you because I just learned that you are now part of the KGRA network. Can you tell us about this? This is very exciting. Yeah, I, this is so cool. I have, I got in touch with Race Hobbs a number of months ago, and we were talking about me coming on board, and it just kind of, it just, I don't know, it just stopped. We just, it just didn't go through at that time. I guess it was meant to be because at this point in time, I have a Thursday slot now. Well, it, it's Thursday my time, but Friday for other people in other parts of the United States. So it's uh, 10 p.m. Uh, actually tonight that we are recording this. So Thursday the 5th is my first episode to come out for him. So it'll be 1 a.m. Eastern time on KGRA. And, of course, you know, you got guys like uh, Micah Hanks, The Grailing Report. You've got you've got Cam and Kyle, Expanded Perspectives. You've got The Richard Dolan Show. Rosemary, uh, Rosemary Ellen Guiley has a show on KGRA. So mm -hmm. for now, it's just going to be a replay. I'm not going to go live for right now. Uh, I think at some point I would like to tackle that beast again because it, it's it's an incredible feeling and it's a, a wonderful way to do a show. But for now, it'll be a rebroadcast of of the Thursday shows. That's awesome. It's only going to open up more people to hear and then to eventually hopefully tell you their stories. So I look forward to that. I'll uh, definitely be listening to that as well. Uh, anything else you got coming up, Shannon, that we shouldn't hear about in this Halloween season? Actually, there are some things, but I don't think I'm allowed to talk about them quite yet. That but is I tell fair. you what, the the second I can, then you know, um, I'll I'll let you know. And if if you're interested in you know hearing about it, I will definitely uh, pop back on. But yeah, there are some really wonderful things coming up, but I just don't think I can talk about them quite yet. I completely understand. Well, if anything, ITF listeners are going to get a reunion in the flesh soon of Shannon, of me, and Mr. Sam Sheeran. So we can definitely promise you that. Yes. Other than that, IntoTheFrayRadio.com is where we can find all your work. Yes, sir. And of course, uh, they can find me on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. And yeah, I'm, I'm happy to connect with people. Like I said, I, I'm happy to chat it up with you. It doesn't have to do uh, with the show. That's totally fine. Just uh, I'm happy to share information with everybody. Awesome. Uh, this this could not have come at a better time, Shannon. I'm so happy we were able to get you on to ring in the Halloween season to hear these incredible stories. And I know the show is only going to grow and you're going to hear more and more stories and it's just going to open up our minds even more. So I have to thank you so much for coming on Somewhere in the Skies today. Thank you, Ryan. I really appreciate it. All right, that is it for this week's episode. Again, you can hear all of Shannon's amazing interviews on Into the Fray Radio, now available on the KGRA network and on all major podcast outlets and at intothefrayradio.com. If you haven't already, please consider rating, reviewing, and subscribing to Somewhere in the Skies on iTunes. It is the largest podcast outlet in the world, and in order for the show to grow and gain visibility, I need your help. Subscribe, rate, review, and please also share the show. The official store is open. T-shirts, tank tops, hoodies, sweatshirts, mugs, stickers, and a bunch of different products, all designed by an incredible artist and loyal listener, Eduardo Lobo. Head on over to tpublic.com and search for Somewhere in the Skies. That's T-E-E-Public.com. If you want to help the show even more, the Patreon is growing and the rewards are getting bigger and bigger. The show is always free to consume, but not free to create. Your monthly contributions assure the show continues and gets bigger and better each and every week. To learn more and to become a patron, visit patreon.com backslash somewhere skies. For guest or topic suggestions or stories to share, contact me through the website somewhereintheskies.com. I'll see you here next week as we officially celebrate Halloween with a very special guest and a topic that will chill you to the core. Remember, keep your feet on the ground, 
but never stop searching somewhere in the skies. Somewhere in the Skies is produced by Third Kind Productions in association with Antica Productions and the Antica Podcast Network. To learn more, visit anticaproductions.com. I'm Dina Del Buccia, one of the hosts of Can't Lit. Every month we talk to writers and members of the literary community about books and stuff. And if you're not interested in books, we also talk about pop culture, go on a lot of tangents, play games, tell stories, and have exciting segments like Can't Lit Feuds, Dina's Rage Minute, and what can't you with? You can find us at Can't Lit on Twitter, Can't Lit on Facebook, Can't Lit.ca, and of course, right here on the Antica Podcast Network. Do, 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 do. Can't Lit, we talk about books and stuff.